Today I'm going to talk about how I edit my film photographs. After analyzing my editing process, I've basically realized that I utilize seven different techniques or tools, not necessarily with every photo, but just in general to achieve a final image. So I've got a few photos here loaded up in Lightroom, and these are photos I've taken over the last few years, and I'm going to use them to demonstrate these seven different tools and techniques that I use to edit my photographs. And before we jump into the editing process, I do want to briefly talk about just my general editing philosophy and what I'm looking to achieve when it comes to a final photo. Essentially, I like to keep things as close to the way I remember the scene being when I was there shooting it. And I will usually increase the contrast and saturation just to give it a little bit of extra life. And in general, I do prefer a warmer image as opposed to a cooler one. But other than that, I'm not looking to change the photograph in any major way. I like to keep things pretty simple and keep that image as close to its organic state as possible. All right, so the way that I'm gonna do this is basically start with an image that needs no adjustments at all and demonstrate one tool or technique per image, slowly stacking them on top of each other so you can see how they all work in unison, but you can also see how they work individually. So the first image that I'm gonna edit is this portrait of Alicia here. And as you can see, you could totally just leave this as is. This does bring me to the first technique, the one that I use pretty much on every single image. It's something that I would just describe as basic color and contrast adjustments. And that's all done in the basic tab here in Lightroom. As I mentioned, I like my images a little bit on the warmer side, so usually I'll bump up the temperature just a little bit. I like my images contrasty, as I said, but this on-camera fl flash already delivers a pretty punchy image, so if anything, I'm gonna actually reduce the contrast just a hair. And it's exposed correctly, so I don't need to adjust the exposure at all. The highlights aren't blown out or anything like that. There's a little bit of a hot spot on her forehead, but don't need to worry about it. Might bring the shadows up again, just to kind of reduce that super harsh contrast that's caused by the on-camera flash. And then maybe raise the saturation just a hair. And that's pretty much exactly how I remember this scene being in real life. So I'm just gonna leave that photo as is. And now is probably a good time to mention that I don't do all of these tools and techniques in the same order with each photo. I kind of click on a new image and just see what right off the bat stands out to me, what I need to correct first. So for example, with this photo in the uh, Budapest train station, you can see that it needs some straightening and it might need some cropping. So that's the second technique or tool that I utilize very frequently, cropping and straightening. So if we scroll down to the transform tab in Lightroom, basically what I'll do is just hit the constrain crop, which makes it so that it's live cropping the photo as you're making your straightening adjustments hit auto and see what happens and as you can see it did a really good job with this photo the lines at the end of the train station are very straight compared to before things are looking quite quite crooked and now it's done a very good job straightening this image sometimes after i hit the auto button and it does a really good job I'll still fine-tune it just a little bit make a slight adjustment or two so for this image it does look to be slightly rotated counterclockwise so I'm gonna adjust that just ever so slightly just rotate it clockwise a little bit and I think from my point of view that looks pretty damn straight so then from there I can go into making my basic adjustments you know, on this one, I'll increase the contrast a little bit, try to retain some of that highlight detail in the back part of the image, which you can do pretty well because it's a film, medium format film negative, and it retains a, that highlight detail really nicely. And increase the shadows. 
and then maybe just warm it up a hair. And that image is looking solid. All right, so as I mentioned while I was editing the previous photo, sometimes the cropping and straightening tool doesn't automatically get the adjustments perfect. And then you gotta go in and manually make some adjustments. So that's kind of the case here on this photo of the Riverside at Budapest. So if we go to Constrain Crop and click Auto, it'll get our horizon level but you can see that I kind of shot this photo at an angle um, from these buildings across the river. And I'd like, to, I'd like the image to kind of appear more straight on. So what I'm gonna do is actually adjust my horizontal axis a little bit and try to make it look like this was taken from a little bit more of a straight on perspective. And right there after that adjustment, you can see now it looks like that's kind of been, that this photo has been taken just straight ahead. And I like that look a little bit better. I'm not really a fan of all this foreground. There's a lot of water here in the foreground. So I'm gonna implement another tool um, in the cropping kind of category. And that's just to basically bring this into a panoramic image. I don't do this all that often, but sometimes it can really, turn a bland photo into something quite a bit more interesting so if i crop this into an aspect ratio that you know mimics something that might have been taken on the hasselblad x pan or just a panoramic camera in general i like the look of this a lot more for this particular photo again i'm not going to do this all that often but every once in a while you know, it's fun to play around with cropping an image to a different aspect ratio because it can really change the entire feel of the photo. All right, the next photo is from a cloudy day in North Bend, Washington. Right off the bat, I notice some straightening that needs to be done. So I'll go ahead and click the auto button in the transform tab and that looks perfect to me. So next I'll utilize my basic color and contrast adjustments by increasing the contrast a little bit, bringing some of the shadow detail back in this photo, increasing the saturation. I'm gonna cool this down just a hair to kind of make it look more neutral. And then once I'm at this step, I no I'm noticing that the sky is completely blown out there's no detail at all in the, in the sky and like I said it was an overcast day but there should be some cloud definition available to us here in the sky so that's gonna bring me to my third tool or technique that I utilize all the time and that is highlight retention now luckily Lightroom makes this process extremely easy all we have to do is go over to our masking tab and it kind of has three presets here for us, one of them being the sky. So I'm just gonna click on that and Lightroom will automatically select the sky. And from my experience, it is extremely accurate almost every single time. And it kind of does a nice feathering job for you too. So now if I go over to my sliders and I bring the highlights back, I'm pulling some information back in the sky, as you can see, we're getting some cloud definition up here in the top left and a little bit in the top right. And I didn't have to drain my highlights in the core part of the photo. As you can see, if we turn that mask off and then just go to our basic tab and crush the highlights down, you'll get some of that definition back in the sky, but we're also dragging the highlights down in the main part of the photo, which I don't really wanna do. I like the way that the highlights look in the main part of the image. I'd like to leave them as is if possible and that's where this masking tool comes in really handy. So as you can see, when we turn that mask back on, we only affected the highlights in the specific part of the image that we have selected, which in this case is the sky. And if we wanna further bring some highlight information back, we could either, we can even drop the exposure down in the sky too 
And as you can see, there's definitely some cloud information that's available to us that we weren't able to previously see just with a straight scan from the lab. In my opinion, this is a subtle adjustment that you can make to your images that makes a huge, huge difference. Here's another photo from that same day in North Bend of a train coming out of the city. Uh, right off the bat, the first thing that I need to do is make some color adjustments. On this photo, I might even just click the auto button on the basic tab and just see what happens. And as you can see, it brought a lot of the highlight detail back on that kind of smoke that's pillowing out of the, the train. I, I don't mind the auto adjustments that Lightroom made to the colors of this photo. I'm gonna increase the saturation just a little bit, cool it off ever so slightly, increase the contrast, bring the shadows up a little more, and uh, I'm gonna implement that same highlight tool that we used in the last photo so that I can keep some of those rich highlights in the core part of the photo. So if we go over to our masking tab, we can try to click the sky and just kind of see what it selects. So as you can see, it selected the sky, but it also selected this smoke coming out of the train so if we drag those highlights down you can see we're getting a ton of information back and that's really creating a lot of separation between the smoke that's coming out of the train and the sky which before just kind of looked like this big white blob and it blended together so i like that a lot if we want to further bring some of that smoke detail back and create further separation in the sky we can actually create a new mask and go to the brush tool and just select what we want specifically, which in this case is the you know, smoke from the train. That way I'm not affecting the highlights in the other part of the sky. And then just drag those highlights back and uh, change our exposure if we want to as well. Now things are looking a little bit purple in the smoke, so I'm just gonna drag that tint towards the green a little bit. Now we have a nice separation between the sky and the smoke coming out of the train. Now to finish up editing this photo, I am gonna make a cropping adjustment here just because I feel like the train should fill more of the frame. So if I bring the crop in a little bit, you know, I feel like having the train be a fuller part of the image looks nice and then auto straighten maybe get a little bit more color a little bit more saturation and then maybe crop in just a teeny bit more and right there i'd call it good before i move on to the next image i briefly want to thank today's sponsor artlist I'm coming up on my third year using Artlist, and it has been a massive game changer for me. I am very methodical about the way I use music in my videos, and Artlist provides high quality, authentic music that is entirely copyright free. But now, Artlist is a whole lot more than just a copyright free music library. They've evolved into an all-in-one platform for content creation. Artlist offers high quality curated music and sound effects with a fantastic filtering system to help you find tunes that fit your project. They also have a library of stock footage, designer video templates and plugins, and even a video and imaging editing software. Artlist also offers five different subscription models, so you're covered no matter what kind of creative field you're in. For example, maybe you're only using music and sound effects for social content, then the social subscription would be a perfect option for you. Or maybe you're doing client work and need the full music and sound effects library along with access to stock footage then the footage and templates option might be great. If you're looking to elevate your creative work to the next level, check out Artlist and head to the link in the description for an additional two months free. Okay, moving on to the next photo. This was shot on the Bronica SQ of my friend Hannah, Cinestill 50D, uh, which I thought was a good film stock to demonstrate the next tool or technique that I want to talk about, which is tone adjustment. So let's start off with our usual adjustments. First of all, I'm going to straighten this. Now I do see this guy over here on the far left side of the frame, which I don't really want <laughs> in the photo, 
So there's a couple different ways I can go about doing that, getting rid of him. Um, for this, I think cropping is just fine. I can just crop in like that, and that's a really simple way to just get that you know, man out of the frame. So now I'll do some basic adjustments here, a little bit more contrast, a little bit more saturation, and uh, maybe bring the shadows up just a hair. So that's looking pretty good from a contrast and saturation standpoint, but Cinestill 50D kind of delivers, you know, this retro type feel, which if that's what you're after, great. But for me, again, I like kind of trying to get these photos back to the way that I remember it being in real life. So I'll implement the fourth tool slash technique here, which is the tone adjustment. And I do that in the color grading section of Lightroom. So overall, the mid-tones are kind of looking yellow. So I'm gonna go up to my mid-tone slider and just try to drag this around and see what starts looking a little bit more neutral. And if I bring it down into the blue section, I think that's the direction I'd like this image to go. So to me, that looks much better there. And then the shadows kind of look a little green as well. So if I play with my shadow slider, bring that down into the blue area a little bit. You know, that's looking much more, much more balanced for sure. So if I wanted to, I could try to get these highlights looking a little bit more natural by dragging this slider away from the purple section of the uh, highlight tones. And now if we go to the before and after, you can see that's just a much more balanced photo. But again, it's really personal preference. There's a lot of people that might totally dig the look of just the straight up Cinestill 50D with a little bit of increased saturation. And that is totally fine. But for me, I think I prefer the balanced version of this photo. All right, next photo, new tool. This is something I call specific color adjustments. But first, let's implement those previous techniques that we used to get this photo to a nice baseline. So I'm gonna increase the shadows a little bit, brighten this up. It's looking overall a little bit purple. So I can change my tint, drag that into the greens a little bit. And then sometimes I just like to play around with different sliders and see how they affect the photo. Like for this during sunset, I remember it being a bit warmer. So I'll drag the temperature into the warm section a little bit, you know, increase the contrast a little bit, increase my saturation. I like it, you know, to be nice and colorful. It already looks pretty straight, so don't need to do anything there. This part of the photo down here, the foreground where the grass is, I don't remember the grass being this particular color. It looks kind of like this awkward orangey red color, which doesn't look all that natural. So, I'd like to change that without affecting the other parts of the image that fall within this same color range, like this guy's canopy, for example. So what I'll do is go over to my masking tab, grab the brush tool, and just draw around this foreground. You know, draw on this grassy area here. All right, now if I go down to this point color sample picker right here, select it, and then just click kind of anywhere on the grass, I get that exact color and then I get the ability to change the hue, the saturation and the luminance. So I'm going to work on changing the hue a little bit and see what that does. So if I drag it kind of over into the yellow area, that looks much more natural to me. And then it wasn't quite as quite as saturated, so I'll drag the saturation down a little bit. And now that looks much more accurate to the way I remember this scene being in real life. So if we look at the difference here, it's a little bit darker red, a little bit more orange versus kind of that more washed out yellowish look. And that is a subtle change, but I think it does make a massive difference on the photo um, as a whole. Now, one other way I like to utilize the masking tab in Lightroom is by selecting specific objects or specific people to maybe increase the shadows or decrease the shadows of that specific part of the image to bring emphasis 
to that part of the photo. So for example, on this photo, I might go to create new mask, hit objects, and then draw around this guy who's paraglide or about to start paragliding and Lightroom will kind of automatically select that person and now I have specific adjustments that I can make to this individual. And for this photo, I'd like to increase the shadows a little bit just to bring a little bit more emphasis to this person in particular. All right, you probably already know where I'm going with this next photo. If you've shot more than a few rolls of film in your lifetime, you've probably ended up with an image that has looked something like this. I am talking about underexposure. There's a couple different ways to deal with an underexposed image. Both are extremely easy and viable in their own right. Before we jump into that, let's go ahead and do our straightening and cropping because this photo definitely needs some of that. Just click our auto button rotate it a little bit further and then I'm gonna crop in so that our subject is centered all right so that looks pretty straight reasonably centered and now what we can do is just crush the blacks down and you know that'll get rid of kind of that haze going on um, you can increase the contrast as well and then you can see that it's kind of got this maroonish reddish tint so we can utilize our tone adjustment strategy in the shadows and just kind of get away from those reds kind of neutralize this photo a little bit and there you go that looks a lot better that's one method um, another method that's also pretty useful is to go to the tone curve and if we go to our previous image here, an image that's reasonably color balanced and exposed properly, and we click on each of these color tone curves, you can see this data stretches pretty much from side to side in the reds, the greens, and the blues. But if we click on this image that's drastically underexposed and we go to our reds, you can see that we are missing all this data over here. So we can just drag this point all the way to where that data is. Do the same thing with the greens, and then do the same thing with the blues. And now we have a pretty balanced image, and we haven't even touched our blacks or contrast yet. And a lot of that haze is gone. You can see the before and the after. And now if things are looking a little bit too cool, you know, you can always come in and warm it up just a hair. Both methods super useful both methods viable kind of comes down to personal preference um, if you want to from here you can further crush the blacks further increase the shadows and to me this looks solid and usable it's a little bit more grainy than usual but uh, kind of adds to the feel and the vibe of the image so not too bad All right, now it's time to talk about the final tool that I utilize quite frequently, and that is object removal. Now, I really try not to remove any major objects from my images, but there's certain things that end up on a film frame that can just be a little bit distracting or annoying. For example, on this photo, we kind of have this big red lens flare going on up here in the tree section of this frame. And you know, it's not a huge deal. You could totally leave it there. I think I did leave it there, leave it there when I delivered these photos, but you know, a lot of people might like this removed. And for a more complicated object removal like this, where the background is kind of complex. So this is where Photoshop's new generative AI has come in actually pretty handy. Right click on this image, hit edit in and then go to Adobe Photoshop 2024, edit a copy with the Lightroom adjustments, and then just go to our selection tool, in this case, the polygonal lasso tool and drag around this lens flare and then hit generative fill. Now it'll give you a few options usually. And uh, for me, the second one looks pretty natural. Again, definitely affected that part of the tree, but you'd never know that 
there was any adjustment made to this tree really. I do prefer this, I think, to a big red orange lens flare. And that's really where I've been implementing Photoshop AI the most is getting rid of these kind of weird sun glares or lens artifacts that pop up on these frames. For example, if we pop back to this paragliding shot, you know, we can see that through my home scan, there was a lot of kind of dust and little hairs left on the frame. That's where Lightroom's built in little eraser tool works just fine, especially on a nice contrasty background like this. But for any more complex artifacts that are on the frame, like for example, this photo, where we've got these big, you know, pentagon shaped lens flares, what I'll do is just hit edit in Adobe Photoshop 2024 and then select the area around these lens flares and doesn't have to be a perfect selection job either. And then just hit generative fill and generate. Most of the time, one of the three selections that Photoshop gives you works just fine. And uh, as you can see that last one, the third one that it delivered, you know, it's not perfect. It's definitely changing that part of the, the image, but I think it's much better to have an image like this uh, without those distracting lens flares. And that is the last uh, tool slash technique that I use. So seven in total, we have the basic color and contrast adjustments, the cropping and straightening, highlight retention, tone adjustment, and then specific color adjustment, dealing with underexposure and object removal. Those are all of the tools and techniques that I implement when I edit my photographs. Again, I don't use every single one on every photo, but over the course of, you know, editing a hundred photos, I will definitely utilize all of those tools. So hopefully that breakdown helped. If you have any questions or want to learn more, there's something that I didn't touch on uh, that you'd like to ask me about. You can do so in the comments or shoot me a DM on Instagram. But for the most part, I like to keep my editing process simple, straightforward, not do anything too crazy. I don't like adjusting the colors, you know, drastically on an image, really. I just like it looking the way I remember it being in real life. And I've kind of always been that way. I imagine I will always be that way. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.